I'm going to keep the main idea of the collision resolution algorithm, but I will provide two additional features for the walls. They will have now mass and elasticity. And then I test the collision on 10 random balls. Last time I started with one dimension, if two balls are about to collide and one has the velocity of 3 and the other has minus 2, then to get their velocities after the collision, first I get the difference between the two velocity vectors, which is the relative velocity, the velocity of one ball relative to the other one. I saw after reorganizing the equations of the conservation of momentum and kinetic energy that in the case of an elastic collision, the relative velocity will be multiplied by minus 1, resulting the new relative velocity, this here. And to get the velocities after the collision, I added the new relative velocity to the first ball's velocity and subtracted it from the second one. If the collision is elastic and the masses are the same, then this means that the two velocity vectors swap after the collision. And I used the same method for the two-dimensional case, except that instead of the velocity vectors, I only need to work with their components along the collision normal, because the tangential component, which is perpendicular to the normal, remains the same after the collision. So instead of the relative velocity of the two velocities, which would be the difference between the two velocity vectors, I needed its projection along the collision normal that I could calculate using the dot product. And the vector that I get after the projection is the separating velocity vector. And that's the vector that gets multiplied by minus 1 after the collision and then will be added to the original velocity vectors. This was the case when the collision was elastic, but if I want to change the value of the elasticity, then what do I need to change in the code? First I create a global variable called elasticity and set its value to 1 because in the elastic collision the value of the elasticity is 1. If the elasticity is 0, that means that the two balls don't bounce apart after the collision, they are glued together and that means that their relative velocity equals 0. I go now to the collision resolution function and what I do here is after the collision the value of the new separation velocity depends on the value of the elasticity. So I multiply the separating velocity by the elasticity. In this case it equals 1 so I just multiplied the value by 1 so everything should work the same, but if I go up and change its value to 0, and I think I also changed the value of the friction so that I can see it better, that they are glued together after the collision, and I can set the elasticity to 0 0.5, and I try it again, then they glue together a little bit, but then they are setting apart. And if I set it to more than one, like let's say three, then after the collision they bounce apart a lot. And this is how I can change the elasticity for the collision of two balls. Then moving on to masses, the idea behind collision with masses is that the change of the ball's velocity vectors will be proportional to their inverse mass, that's 1 over the mass. So the higher the value of the mass is, the smaller the inverse mass and the smaller the change of the velocity will be. So I go to the ball class and I'm going to create a new property, the mass, and this will be required when creating a new ball. And I also create another property. That's the inverse mass, which will be equal 1 over mass, except when the value of the mass is 0, because then the inverse mass will be 0 too. 
And now it's time to make the change of velocities along the collision normal proportional to the inverse masses while keeping the conversation of momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. It's the amount of motion that an object has and the change of momentum over time is called impulse. When I say that the velocities must be proportional to the inverse masses, it's true for the impulse as well, since the masses won't change after the collision. So the change of the total impulse depends on the change of the separating velocity after the collision, which equals the new separating velocity minus the original one, that will be the separating velocity difference. To calculate the impulse to apply, I divide this difference by the sum of the inverse masses, that will be the magnitude of the impulse vector that goes along the collision vector, and this impulse vector will be the one that I add to the ball's velocity vectors in proportion of the inverse masses. And now if I instantiate the balls, I will add masses to them. This will get 2 and this will get 5. And let's see what happens if they collide. Now it's already visible, but let's try this one with 20 instead. Now the second ball is moving much less after the collision and if I set the mass to zero then the ball shouldn't move at all, the second one. The reason it still does a little bit is because of the penetration resolution. It moves the two balls apart by the same amount. But that's something I can change in the penetration resolution function. I can make it proportional to the inverse masses, just like I did in the collision resolution function. Instead of dividing by 2, I divide the penetration depth by the sum of the inverse masses and the penetration resolution vector will be multiplied by the first ball's inverse mass and by the second ball's inverse mass times minus 1. And in this case, if the inverse mass is 0, then the ball won't move along the collision normal, since the magnitude of the separating vector will be 0. And let's check if that's true or false. It seems to be correct. Second ball is now not moving. It looks that the elasticity and the mass have been implemented successfully. Let's make the elasticity a property of the ball class with the default value of 1. Then I can set the second ball's elasticity to 0 0.3. And here where I use the elasticity in the collision resolution, instead of the elasticity variable, I will just use the smaller one. And let's try first with the mass of zero. and then set it back to 5. To keep track of the mass and elasticity values, I'm going to display these properties on each ball. So I go to the ball classes display method and the velocity can actually stay there. It will start at the center 
both of these properties will be displayed somewhere around the central point, although this will be a little bit above. And here you go. What I would like to do next is creating 10 balls on the canvas with random positions and random mass and radius and elasticity. And in order to do that, first I'm going to create a new function that returns a random integer within a given range between min and max. These will be the two arguments. Let's say I want to have a random integer from 7 to 10. Then first I take the difference, which is 3, and add 1 to them. That makes it 4. Then I use the random function that returns a pseudo-random number between 0 and 1, and I multiply this random number by 4. Then I use the floor function that returns the greatest integer less than or equal to its numeric arguments. This is the numeric argument. And this expression will be 0, 1, 2, or 3. And if I add to this number the lowest value of the range, which is 7, then the result will be 7, 8, 9, or 10. So that's how the function works. And that's what I can use to create ball objects with random properties. Instead of these two lines, I'm going to create a for loop. So it's creating a new ball object with random arguments 10 times in a row and the elasticity will be a random number from 0 to 10 divided by 10 because elasticity ranges from 0 to 1. Then let's see the result on the canvas. Here, 10 balls with random properties. There is one with zero mass, that's the one that doesn't move. Good. This is how far I was going to go in terms of ball-ball collision. Next time I will introduce the walls and the balls collisions with the walls, which will be easier after going through this ball-ball collision process. Collision with the walls will be simpler.